Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, this is on DBT for borderlines plus PTSD after sexual, childhood sexual abuse. The point is, the consequences of childhood sexual abuse are multiple. Um, it's usually, if you think about CSA and the consequences, you always think it's, it must be PTSD, but that's not the, not the truth. Uh, most of them have uh, all sorts of uh, psychiatric disorders. There's anxiety disorders, depression. Here you see all the osteoarthritis. Then substance abuse, then PTB, uh, PTSD. Sleep, in, sleep disorder is a major issue. Suicide attempts and BPD. The osteoarthritis is 3.4. And they have subsexual or more symptom levels, there's a high level of dissociation, low self-esteem, and somatic disorders. So the problem is when it comes to what we call complex PTSD, I know that in the, uh, in, uh, the DSM the term complex uh, PTSD didn't come through in the ICD-11, it will exist. So Usually things show up like this, so you cannot sort it out and say, but patients have more or, more or less all of all together. And it's very complicated uh, to follow something like uh, take out protocol A and treat anxiety, take out pro protocol B and treat depression, take out protocol C and so on. This simply most of the time doesn't work. So you have, it's a multi-component, multiplex and very dynamic disorder. and. Uh, if we, <coughs> the, the whole clinical feature is on the one hand driven by normal PTSD symptoms like intrusions, hyperreactivity and avoidance, that's basic. And then adding on, if it comes to early, child, early uh, PTSD, we have severe problems in emotion regulation, mainly on uh, problems with shame, guilt and disgust, self-contempt. And you have an extremely negative and uh, fluctuate uh, neg uh, self-concept and you have a very negative body concept which is an important issue which is mostly under uh, studied and of course relationship problems. So if you look at that you see this fits entirely in our field of borderlines and uh, if you look at the data you could say Mary Sonorini has done a lot of research on this and I hope it fits um, to your uh, data that in inpatient samples or residential samples, as we call it in Europe, we say about 60% of our patients uh, suffer from co occurring PTSD, and in community samples, you could say about 30 35%. Means that those with this uh, PT additional PTSD they take the harder course, uh, and uh, so this is uh, PTSD is a major uh, impact on a negative outcome course. The other way around, if you look at uh, PTSD samples, you see about 35% uh, meeting full borderline criteria. So this takes no wonder. These are data from a uh, Freiburg study. <coughs> we looked at 300 consecutive <coughs> patients. And what, uh, we applied something what we called biogra biographical interview. And here you see that about uh, sexual abuse is reported from about 60%, physical abuse about 40%, and witnessing violence between parents also 30%, but the major point is, is here you see this large overlap. So when it comes to online patients, the majority has not only sexual abuse, but also physical abuse and also violence between parents, and emotional neglect is adding, so you see it's a very complex uh, problem. That means usually if it comes to borderline patients, they report not one or two or three traumata, they report a whole bunch of, let's say, you know that this is, and this is ma a major clinical problem since uh, where to start. And uh, it took us some time to figure that out. So the overview of this presentation is, first, do, really, do we really need a new treatment? You know, treatment development is fashion, and I don't know how it's in the States, in Europe is every, Every month a new treatment comes out. It's more or less the only way to get famous as a psychotherapist is to develop some kind of treatment and make a little bit of money. And there are tricky things to develop it, so I think it's, it's yeah, we're a little bit overwhelmed. So I think you have to really to justify yourself if you do this. Then, second, we go for the, I report a little bit on what we think which problem have to be solved in this new treatment. 
Then I explain a little bit the basics and principles of this treatment. I give you the data and uh, also give you data on safety issues. So why is this treatment needed? If you look at the literature, there are currently five meter analysis on six RCTs. This is how research works currently. It's uh, much easier to conduct meter analysis than to really provide uh, RCTs. So people go on meter analysis and it's totally ridiculous if you lead five meter analysis on six RCTs. Uh, and um, see, that means on PTSD after childhood sexual abuse. There's lots of tons of data on PTSD, of course, but sexual abuse is mostly understudied. These are now the seven, since when I added ours here, so we are the sevens. So you see, that's a, and mainly these are only two treatments. This is the treatment mainly from, from Marilyn Cloitre, who is based on exposure plus some skills. It's not DBT skills, some special other skills. And the other thing is pediresics, uh, which is totally cognitive processing therapy, more or less. And um, so there's this ongoing debate whether it's, uh, it's, it's uh, sufficient enough only to work uh, with cognitive processing or whether exposure is really needed and whether you can apply uh, exposure-based treatments to these highly vulnerable patients. If you look at the treatment exclusion criteria, we, keep, we, we looked study for study for study, very careful. So the first study excluded substance abuse severe dissociation. The second study excluded eating disorders, substance abuse, dissociation, BPD, suicide attempts. And as you see here, the caps, this is the caps at the beginning, clinical administered PTSD scale, that's quite important. This is like the Hamilton for PTSD. It's about 69. Chart excluded substance abuse, suicidality. McDonough excluded suicide attempt history and substance abuse, RESIC excluded suicidality, Cloyte included some BPD patients but did not report about that. So the point is that mainly our patients did, simply did not fit in this. Um, and this is my favorite slide, I love it. This is a little bit the situation where you are always, this is our patients here, and they simply do not fit into our current treatment system. So you can do two things, either you change the patient or you change the treatment. We decided to do the second one. So, however, I also have to say, DBT has its own implicit rule. I think most of you are aware that I'm a close co-worker of Marsha. And uh, we could say, okay, why not simply to apply DBT on this group of patients? This is an analysis of uh, one year outcome on stage, uh, on, on axis one disorders after DBT given by Marsha's last. Yeah, you know, exactly. And here you look, uh, patients who had been diagnosed with co-occurring PTSD at the, begin, uh, at the beginning of the treatment, only 13% of them had a remission. This means you, should, more than, you can say more or less 90% do not respond on standard DBT in the, within, during the treatment phase. It's a little bit better one year after. Why do they respond at all? I think DBT is very good in stress reduction. And uh, of course, uh, PTSD features are triggered by stress. You can, inc you can inject Yohimbine as an adrenergic substance and you can just induce PTSD. This has not always to be some social uh, event or something else. So a treatment which helps you in general to cope your stress helps a little bit, but it's far from being sufficient. And in DBT we also had this rumor that you cannot apply trauma-focused treatment before the patients are not eager to control their self mutilization or their suicide attempt and so on. So this was always a stage-driven treatment where I said first behavioral control, then you go for PTSD. And I think this is more the rumor in any treatment. The problem was we saw tons of patients who simply said, okay, I wanna, I wanna get rid of this trauma. I want to be help. I want to have help. Then we said, okay, no problem. We can help you. But first, you have to learn how to apply skills to to quit your cutting and so on. And then they said, yeah, listen, but I need that uh, that cutting or something to stop the severe dissociation since this is my major trauma issue. 
So this is a vicious circle. And uh, um, after a while hearing that, we thought, okay, where the heck is it? Do we really have data that what we teach and preach that uh, is, is true? Is it true that you first have to have control over your cells with immunization before you can go for exposure? This every clinician would tell us, but we never had data. So then we said, okay, I simply don't know that. And I think this is why I love science sometimes that you really can look after your own assumptions and if you're lucky you can see that they're wrong. Um, so what we decided to do then is develop a treatment uh, with a major focus on exposure. I tell you it's a blending of different things. However, we want it clearly include or not to include, exclude here highly dissociated features. This means we want to take them in as they are. Uh, we take them in if they are chronically suicidal, if they are still on self-harm, uh, if they are on current substance abuse, if they have CT eating disorders, and what's important, we have our client, clients, on the average, have a cups about 90. The American studies, they run around 64, uh, 65 when they start. Yeah? So this was a long debate with uh, Patty Resnick and Marilyn Kloite whether we really do have the same clients and also a long debate with Edna for her, since she totally insisted that no problem, you can do uh, prolonged exposure in borderline, no, no troubles. However, if you looked at the data, she also starts with the caps about 60. And there's a difference between 90 and 60, it's a huge difference. So this means we simply want to take in the severe of the severe. So from our perspective, then we, we try to understand the whole thing. So what, what are the major problems? And from a, let's say, more evolutionary perspective or some a social, psychological perspective. The problem is the following. If it comes to interpersonal violence during adolescence and childhood, and mostly uh, combined with emotional neglect, the first thing you have to do is you t uh, the, the whole organism is, 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 has problems with self-protection. That's clear. It's a dangerous situation, harming and biologically uh, threatening. So the self-protective system is activated. The self-protective systems, you know, lots of aversive emotion, anxiety, fear, pain, threat. And uh, the system is, drives you to specific action urges. You have short-term urges and long-term urges, how emotions are. This means the first thing is to survive. You can either flight, fight, claim for help, help or freeze. Mostly patients freeze. Then the long-term system means you have to protect yourself. Protect means you have to avoid what happens, you have to understand why did this happen, and you have, if it works, you have to improve the situation. This gives you a sense of security. But what is the real problem? In, this is standard PTSD, standard PTSD. But when it comes really to adolescent, to juvenile, child, juvenile and adolescent is problematic. The major problem is you still have to stay in this family. And how can you stay in a family where, where torture is on the, on the record? The f and you only can stay in this family without getting emotionally totally destructive if you keep attached to your family. And if you keep attached to your family, you have to love your father or your mother. And if you have to, on the one hand, your safety system is activating and you're, uh, you're threatened by the attachment system, you have to manage this problem. And what is the major issue to manage this problem? I think this is the core idea to understand complex PTSD. The point is, you have to make it clear, it's all up to you. It's not your father, it's not your mother, it's you who is the problem. This enables you to keep your attachment system activated. Of course, it's a little threatened, but it enables you. And you develop a strong, loved relationship to your perpetrators. This is the story you have usually. It's always this ambivalent problem with a uh, high level of anxiety and affiliation. So what happens is the self-protection system is activated and fear and threat is activated and the brain is working. Why did this happen to me? And there are several ideas. Patients have several ideas. The first is if you're young, you say this is normal. This is simple what fathers have to do. Then, if you grow out of the primary family, you go to school, you see, oh wow, this is only normal in our family. Uh, other families are different. 
And then emotions start, and the major emotion here is shame. You try to keep that away from, co uh, co uh, from communication. You don't want to bring friends home and so on. You start feeling isolated. You start feeling the ashamed about you and your family. Shame is always driven by, uh, by, you can also be ashamed by your family. That's very important. The second is, I am somehow wrong. Yeah? Since otherwise that wouldn't happen. The major emotion again is shame. Then, the other opportunity is to say that not only I am wrong, but I did something wrong. Right? It's different. And doing something wrong uh, is the major cognition leading to guilt. So, the whole thing is, if it comes to shame and guilt, which is more or less secondary emotion to cope with this whole sexual abuse issue, then uh, the problem is if you are, feel ashamed and guilty, both are social emotions and both activate what we say is some sort of a basic cognitive, cognitive assumption. This means I will be rejected and excluded by the others if they find out, if they see how bad I am or what I did. And this is one major threat, threat, uh, threat of the whole, of the complete social affiliation system. If you look on P uh, patients with BPD and PTSD, you see here uh, that rejection sensitivity is one of the major psychopathological issues, you think. We, this is not in our work, this is uh, by Stäbler et al. in 2011. Uh, here you see uh, uh, some different uh, psych psychiatric disorders, anxiety disorders, mood disorder, even social phobias, BPD patients and BPD inpatients, and you see the level of, uh, of rejection sensitivity is rather specific for this group of patients. And we tested this back and forth in the last two or three years. We, we developed, for instance, a an, an virtual group paradigm with head-mounted displays where they can uh, move around and see others and we can manipulate this group situation and do assessments back and forth. And, um, we t and what we found out, it's one of the first findings, is the major problem of borderline patients, at least in our group, this means patients with borderline plus PTSD, is not hypersensitivity to rejection, but it is a hyper, uh, it, the problems come with inclusion conditions. Let's see, for instance, here, this is the social expectation here. Uh, the question is, in this virtual paradigm, they, they do some, some standardized talks, and then we say, what do you expect? How many people would like to meet you again? Or what, did you, would, what would you expect? How many uh, people would like to go uh, to hang out with you or go for a coffee and so on? And these are healths and these are borderlines and this is clear, we, everybody expected this, that they in, at the beginning they have a significantly lower um, expectancy uh, um, f uh, regarding social inclusions, but now we give them feedback and they give feedback like this, here in the scanner we can do it and say, um, uh, this is the question, how many people do you, do you think would invite you again? Then you see, oh, six of, six, uh, five of six uh, would invite you. Or all six would invite you. And you give positive feedback in a row. And if you do this in healthy patient, uh, people, you see, even they start rather high, they increase their expectations. They say, okay, this group is nice to me. Uh, I expect next uh, that, that, they, that they like me. All my patients don't react at all. This means they cannot work and include social back information. And it's even worse um, when it comes to, to trust games after this social inclusion or exclusion. The point is they are worse after inclusion. Since they get, uh, this, I think Peter would say this is a problem of epistemic trust, but I like this term. The, the point is you get totally um, distracted or irritated if somebody gives you some sort of positive information since this is exactly not that what you expected and this is, is um, controversial to your self-concept. This is highly, the, the, the low uh, expectation is highly uh, correlated to your level of rejection sensitivity so th I think this is quite a good assessment. So back to basic uh, social psychology. If you look at this uh, basic human needs, this is the old Maslow model. Meanwhile, good, ex uh, new, um, uh, newly developed and uh, operationalized by Kenrick. Here you see these human needs are organized like a, uh, in, a, in a hierarchical system, like a pyramid. The basic is always immediate physi physiological needs. Then, if the, 
self-protection, then if, if self-protection and physiological needs are okay, you could think about social affiliation. If social affiliation is clear, then you can think about social ranking. And if the ranking is okay, then you could develop your individual values. The problem is our clients are, hang, uh, are, hang, are stuck here. So there are both systems, self-protection and social affiliation are totally insecure. And as long as these points are insecure, they cannot work on social rankings and they cannot work on their individual values. The simple doesn't, this is simply not function. This is how uh, human psychology works. So they are here. And um, the, the best place to stay here is somewhere in the psychiatric network. As long as you are in the psychiatric network, you don't have to think about social ranking and individual values. So this means that the role of a chronic patient is not the worst role for, for somebody who is really stuck in these problems. So from our perspective, our, our patients have three major problems. Of course, memory processing, like PTSD has, is clear. Then affect regulation, typically for, for, for borderlands, and specific problems in social affiliation, which I think are more specific, and you have to teach them specifics in sexual abuse is something different than uh, uh, simply um, it's, it's a neglect or anything. So the basics and principles of our treatment, we, it's a blending. So we blended A, DBT. Why did we do this? First. It, there are clear rules, clear concepts, clear strategies, which make it easy to work with these high complex people. Second, DBT is good in, uh, in uh, skills, and patients need that sort of, of skills. Then we added uh, trauma-focused cognitive and exposure-based interventions. Why do we, did we do that? Since, mm, from my perspective, data clearly show that exposure should be the number one treatment as long as patients stand it. Um, this is Anke Ehlers, Edna Foa. Then we added Paul Gilbert's compassion-focused therapy. Why did we do this? Um, I don't know whether you're familiar with Paul Gilbert. Uh, this compassion-focused therapy is, from my perspective, one of the best uh, established or developed tools to work on self-compassion. Um, and we, we developed something what we said, okay, this compassionate mindfulness. So this, this standard fan-driven mindfulness from, uh, from DBT, we switched a little bit to the more compassionate uh, mindfulness, which is uh, another tradition in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the Buddhism as not the sand-driven, but the vipassana-driven way. And not to, uh, we also we, we took the concept of values uh, for motivational issues from ACT. And I think from my perspective, the whole, when it comes to acceptance, and uh, I think um, trauma to therapy has a lot to do with acceptance of that, what happened. ACT is, from my perspective, the currently best developed treatment. So you see it's a mixture, it's a blending. And um, it took us six years development phase. We did it in the residential treatment. Why that? We said, of course we want to really look for exposure-based treatment. And since we are not sure that they really can stand it, and we want to take people who are still suicidal and cutting themselves. So do it in an outpatient uh, level, it's a, a little bit risky. And we are we were in that advantage that we knew how to, how to uh, deal with uh, patients on a residential treatment. We learned this in, in the States at, uh, at, uh, at uh, well, Cornell, yeah? And we brought it over to Germany and we have it there. We, and now, meanwhile, we had 800 patients within the last 10 years, 800 treated by that. So I think we have quite a lot of experience. It took us the first six years really to develop. We tested this and this and this and this. And after six years, we had it. And then we run this RCT. So from a more behavioral level, um, we, our model looks like this. The point is we are, the, the whole treatment is more emotion focused than cognitive focused. And our thinking is that every emotion is driven, of course, by some sort of a cue, which is activating what we call a primary emotion. A primary emotion is, um, this is the emotion which had been activated during the trauma. So 
this is not the, 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 the normal term on primary and secondary emotion. We say primary emotion is exactly the emotion which reminds you to the, prime, to the emotion during the trauma. And this is a trigger for activation, what we call a trauma-associated network. So this brings up other emotions, this brings cognitions, this brings physical uh, appearance, this brings flashbacks, and so on. The problem is, if this network is activated, the reality is more or less in a misty, cloudy somewhere, and you cannot interact adequately, since you always play, uh, you act like you are in the wrong movie. Then, patients develop a whole bunch of escape strategies to escape here, and secondary, they develop a whole bunch of avoidance strategy of these cues. It's all reasonable. If it comes to treatment, our thinking is you have to strengthen uh, the reality contact and to de decrease this uh, um, um, response pattern, this automatized response pattern. And in, from a behavioral perspective, it's a need that you, uh, during, during exposure, you have to train them to block their cognitive and emotional and behavioral escapes, and on the long run, to block their avoidance strategies. So this is a simple, mechanistic, behavioral approach. Then, next stop was, what are the primary trauma-associated uh, associated emotions? This is, of course, very individualized. Every patient is different. However, there are some sort of emotions which a therapist should know and should know how to handle it and she should uh, ask for them. So the first, of course, mostly is helplessness. Then disgust is very, very, very important. Since, to saying the hard words, it comes, often comes to oral penetration and oral penetration usually is, is totally linked to disgust. Anxiety is important but not that important since most of the abused uh, kids are used to that. So this is a repetitive pattern and they know it already. So major, the major focus on anxiety is cut, is, is gripping too short. Um, sexual arousal is an important feature. We did studies on that now. About 30 or 40 percent of the victims report about sexual arousal and uh, they are totally ashamed about that. So you have to explain it, you have to work with that. It has a strong impact on the adult female uh, sexuality. Humiliation, threat, and confusion. So those are, the, those are the primary emotions. Anger almost never appears. However, there are also positive primary emotions. So it's one of the major mistakes in psychiatry. It's always looking only on the negative emotions. So positive emotions are, they feel special. Why do they do that? Since they say, you're better than your mother, you're better than your sister, uh, and they get very close. So this is closeness, means uh, uh, sometimes we, we, we did some work with perpetrators, uh, and the point is some of them really report totally crazy love affairs. So there is something like a strong, it's not only strange offenders, there's a strong relationship, strong pathological relationships. And a lot of the perpetrators report that they have been rumoring all the time about these kids, like some, like some obsessive uh, relationships. And this is, so this, there comes up some really pathological closeness and pride. Pride means simply, okay, you are so good. Um, and we often see that in the first two, three years, they, they are, not only, are not aware what happens. This is often a post hoc uh, um, problematic then. So, but the point is that not only is these emotions, but also these emotions can function as internal stimuli of these trauma-associated networks. And now you can understand how life must be if you have to avoid helplessness, disgust, anxiety, sexual arousal, humiliation, threat, confusion, and pride, and closeness. So this is a very, very uh, restricted emotional life. And since you cannot cut out one emotion, they usually cut off the, uh, the, the whole emotional system, so this means either they are numb or they are overwhelmed. And um, if it comes, let's say here, we have been talking about avoidance and escape, so we should know what are the major escape mechanisms. You see again, this is a behavioral perspective. I don't say this is the truth, but it's a good work ground. Um, what is uh, on the behavior? Suicide attempts are, from my, from my perspective, dysfunctional problem solving. Um, Self-harm also, high risk, drugs, alcohol, vomiting, promiscuity. This is important also, washing, showering. 35% have 
criteria for OCD. Why? This is discussed. And they have routinely, uh, routinely uh, procedures how to work on that. Um, then we have cognitive escape strategies, suicide rumoring and ideation, of course. Then destruction, often rumination, denial, or minimizing. This, this is a standard cognitive strategies. And this is what we learned the hard way, and it took us long to, to, to get that clear. You also have emotional escape mechanisms. The psychoanalysts call this, these are emotional bypasses. Um, and I think this is a quite nice term. So you, you switch from one emotion, which is hard to, to keep to another emotion, which is also awful, but better to, um, to integrate. And the secondary emotion is anger, guilt, shame, self-contempt, and self-hate. And this is quite important since during treatment, if you go for exposure and you go for the primary emotion, most of the time, these secondary emotions like self-complaints, guilt, shame, and so they arise and people get stuck and hang in these problems. So you have to work on these secondary emotions first to explain them, to really clarify how to, what is shame, what is guilt, why did you develop this, what are the reasons for that, what can, how can you taper down, and so on. So this is, uh, from my perspective, important, and this is also why you cannot simply uh, memorize the trauma, since if you simply memorize the trauma and you do cognitive process, simply exposure, then people get stuck in the secondary emotions. So from my perspective, you have to be more precise, like, a, like it's like a surgery. And then is emotional escape, dissociation, numbness, and depressions. From my being, is there are emotional stuck states where you simply cut off your, your emotion system. And of course, avoidance strategies. This is not a complete number. Restrictive nutrition, uh, social phobia, then dressing. Uh, most of them, uh, some ugly dressing, inadequate personal hygiene, weight gaining, and so on. So it's all sorts of. So the challenge one is helping the client to identify, to label, and to block their major escape strategies. Challenge two is to help the therapist to discriminate between primary and secondary emotions. So they really have to come clear. What is an avoidance emotion and what is a primary emotion? And helping the therapist to deal with, yeah, how to deal with the secondary emotions, guilt, shame, disgust, self-contempt, body-related aversive emotions. Then, if it comes to treatment, we want to change emotional memory. And if we go for reconsolidation of, of memory, we have, to have three important issues to consider. The first is we always have to re exposure to the aversive stimuli, otherwise the, the, the brain is not uploaded. Uh, the brain has to learn that this time the context is different. So from a simple psychological perspective, you could say trauma treatment is context learning. This, this simply learns, okay, this time the situation is different, so this is, belongs to the past. And uh, it has different consequences. So, uh, first thing is that there has to be some emotional and physical, physiological activation, and you have to have functional neuroplasticity. That means the brain has to be eager to, to, to learn. So benzos are a, a drug intoxication, um, low BMI, lower than 15, and some of like, it does, it does inhibit, it, they inhibit simply the, the learning capacity, so you have to block that. I think most of you here are familiar with some, some sort of slide like this, where we assess the level of stress uh, in related to the, the dissociative symptoms. The red line are borderline patients. Um, this is all the data Tim Trull has published with us. Um, so this means that patients, borderline patients with PTSD, there's a, a correlation of about 0.87 between the level of distress and the level of dissociation. To make it simple, means if you stress patients, they start to dissociate. Well, is that a problem? Yes. The problem is, this is our data from classical conditioning experiments where we, where we uh, uh, did some negative conditioning experiments with our patients. And you see during this conditioning, these are healthy contrast uh, patients learning that let's say a, 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 a spider or something like that, or, or, or a power, um, electrical power is related to a picture. They learn as, as good as borderline patients. However, these are patients who dissociate during the learning experiment. And we have replicated this now three or four times. Dissociation simply means patients don't learn. 
Why is it the case? This is the case due to the fact that the amygdala are shut off during dissociation, dis during dissociation and the hippocampus activation is lower down. So this means short-term memory is inhibited, and if you have no memory uh, storage, you cannot learn. So the, this is our good news for therapists who talk bullshit, since as long as you stress your patients, they won't remember it. <laughs> as soon as you think, OK, I think my words are precious pearls, uh, and you want to make your patient make remi reminding your, uh, your fantastic interventions, you should clearly try to lower down the dissociation level. This is the old jerk dots rule, and I like it. It's 1908. So this simply says, here's the level of, uh, of arous arousal distress, distress, and here's the efficiency of emotional learning. There's an optimal level in the middle. This means here, in this situation, people don't learn that much, and here, they don't le learn that much. And if you translate this and say, OK, here is our green area. Here, the whole field is not activated. They are rationalizing. They are uh, talking over and so on. Here, they start to get dissociated. And therapists have to have two tools. The one is to increase this level of, uh, of, of, uh, of engagement. And the other is to decrease, to attenuate that. And this is what, so we learn how to help the client to taper down acute ar arousal and block dissociation during exposure. So this is what we call skills-assisted exposure. This is what we apply for. I show you a tape how that works. So on the one hand, if, it's, if you know, should know how to increase trauma-associated primary emotion, on the other hand, you should know how to increase reality and context awareness. So and now, sometimes it works. Okay. So, perform on. No, it's very exciting. I hope you can yeah. read the red one. I have a bit of fear. Yeah, sure. I can understand, yeah. You can still do it. Yeah. Why? Ja, ich habe es mir vorgenommen und ich will einfach jetzt auch mal drüber sprechen. Can you read it or I talk it? Finde ich gut. Das wird Erfolg haben, aber es wird anstrengend werden. Aber ich bringe sie da durch. Okay? Also, jetzt folgendes. Ich werde Sie bitten, da drauf zu stellen auf dieses Wackelbrett. Das, haben wir, das kennen Sie. Das hilft einfach, um die Dissertation zu blocken. Sie müssen ein bisschen Gleichgewicht halten und dann mhm. ist es eine Sache. Und dann wollte ich Sie fragen, ist es, sind Sie einverstanden, wenn ich Ihnen die Hände gebe, während wir die Exposition machen? Ja. Ist es okay für Sie? Ja, wenn das dazugehört. Wenn es für Sie okay ist, ist es meistens besser. Ja, okay. Okay, dann fangen wir an. Jetzt gehen Sie da drauf. Sie haben das Trauma mal aufgeschrieben. Mhm. Äh, und wir haben es auch schon mal durchgesprochen. Und heute geht es darum, komplett reinzugehen. Mhm. Und ich werde Sie bitten, in der ersten Person, ja, mhm. sich das wirklich vorzustellen und die unangenehmste Sequenz zu erzählen. Also da, wo es wirklich richtig fürchterlich war. Mhm. Wir stehen das durch, okay? Okay. Gut, also, jetzt schließen Sie die Augen und erzählen, was sehen Sie? Also, ich bin in meinem Bett mhm. und ähm, ich lese, ich habe meine kleine Nachttischlampe. Mhm. Was haben Sie für einen Schlafanzug an? So ein weißes T-Shirt. Mhm. Okay. Ja. Und was hat die Bettdecke für die Farbe? Die ist blau und hat so gelbe Sonnen. Okay, schön. Sind Sie richtig da. Was passiert weiter? Dann geht die Tür auf. Okay. Und er kommt rein. Mhm. Und dann setzt er sich neben mich mhm. auf die Bettkante. Wer ist er? Ein Vater. Okay. Und was hat er an? So ein, ähm, so ein violetter Schlafanzug, so mit so Streifen. Okay. Dann... Okay, mal ganz kurz. Spüren Sie meine Hände? Ja. Okay. Wie fühlen Sie sich an? 
Ähm, ja, kräftig. Okay, gut. Was ist anders heute im Vergleich zu damals? Ich weiß nicht. Machen Sie mal die Augen auf. Wie groß sind Sie heute? Nicht 1,70 oder so. Was sehen Sie? Sie sind so groß wie ich. Ja. Sehen Sie das? Ja. Okay. Schauen Sie mal kurz im Raum um. Wo sind Sie? Diesen der Bibliothek. Okay. In diesem Therapieraum. Okay. Gut. Jetzt gehen Sie wieder rein. Soll ich einfach jetzt weiter erzählen ja. oder wie? Also und dann setzt er sich eben hin, so neben mir. Mhm. Dann okay. So, just as an example, I hope you could read it. I have to switch from the red to the, to the white line. Sorry about this. So the point is, the first thing, why do we do this on this wakeboard? Um, we, it's really data driven. <laughs> the point is, as long as you're fighting against gravity, your medulla oblongata cannot, cannot dissociate. <laughs> and the dissociation is a major point, seems to be at the uh, periaqueductal gray, which is very closely related. To, so as long as you are balancing and you have to balance, you simply cannot dissociate. And uh, for that, keeping pe people in this balance is one of the best, best positions. The second is, why do we give the hands? There are two reasons. I think this looks a bit weird for you in the States. Uh, therapists don't do that, hands off. First, of course, I asked her whether she is fine with that. Second, I want to have a physical contact. Since we, if she really starts to switch off, I just peck her and say, listen, do you feel it? I want to have strong sensory input. We have data on that, that memory reconsolidation works better if you apply strong sensory in input during this reconsolidation phase. And this is not only cognitive, it's really sensory. So I, I ask, how, what's the difference between then and now? And she says, uh, she's older. And so how do you see this? Yeah, since I really want to have, okay, look at this. Look at me, look at the room, what, what's the difference? So this is discrimination training on the sensory level. Yeah? So this is context, bringing in context all the time. I don't know whether there is really a need for that. This is simply what we developed. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is with the hands, from my perspective, is um, lots of people feel very ashamed if they start talking about. And the major consequence of shame is that you get, uh, lose your social contact. This means uh, the one who, who you tell a story, they feel disgusted by you. And as a therapist, you're still sitting there and say, okay, I still like you. It's a bit, little bit ridiculous. She can say you're paid for, uh, and she's right. So the point is, as long as I have my hand, I don't have to talk about that. So she still has some physical contact. Peter would say it was reinforced the trust system, <laughs> maybe. I think this is an important thing. Um, I mean, not all this touch them, yeah? but this is just an example. She's an actress. Um, so this is just bringing all together. Understand a little bit the key issues? Okay. So, next problem is, of course, most of our patients, they are, uh, they are chronic, uh, chronic PTSD and BPD patients. That means how to define the inclusion criteria and how can we pr uh, provide safe conditions. So, the pathway to treatment, and this is a little bit different, like Melanie Harnd is doing that. So, you can ha uh, have, um, have done a stage 1 DBT, but you don't have to do it. So we, in our treatment now, 90% did never have uh, some sort of PTSD. We just can take them in. So here, then we give them, uh, the, uh, here, we do some sort of assessment uh, on, the, uh, on um, uh, high risk uh, uh, behavior, then they get the residential program for three months and then they go out. Um, we have some exclusion criteria. This means we want that the last potential lethal suicide attempt is longer than eight weeks ago. Lethal means sl really slicing the carotis or uh, opening your stomach or something like that. This means not intoxication. So really the hardest of the hardest. And if they have it done, to, uh, let's say, within the last two weeks or something, we say, okay, we want to work on that for at least four or five sessions that, that we are sure. That's the only prerequisite we have. And if they are very hostile and aggressive, we cannot treat them at the unit, since we have to have safe uh, conditions for everybody. So we, uh, the very uh, the strong, aggressive people we treat uh, on an outpatient manner. 
And uh, if they have life-threatening, out-of-control, high-risk behavior, it means we had a patient, for example, who took the bicycle drive on the, hi on the highway or something like that. This is not very healthy. This is not a suicide attempt, but it's, you know, and it's a bit, little bit too dangerous, so we work with her and say, okay, at least you have to do this not for two months. And also a point where we, where we send them to standard protocol first if they have ongoing sexual contact to the perpetrator. This is a major problem. It's not very often, but you have to ask for, since you simply cannot work um, with this issue and say this belongs to the past if she goes out and makes past uh, uh, a present out of the past. So this is difficult to work. We work, this is for this is some special treatment we have about, in our last six, seven hundred, we have ten of about of those. This does not mean we don't treat them, this means we put another sort of treatment in front. So, the next, the last point, challenge is chronicity. Most patients live with this PTC for decades, decades, and they are adapted to an environment which is either used to or reinforcing PTC-related behavior. Most of them have really maladaptive partners with weird sexual sportive issues. Uh, then they have most of the time very maladaptive social networks. If they are at all social networks, I think 90% are the borderline patients or some therapists or priests or social workers. Uh, and almost none of our patients has had, uh, had real job conditions. And they also are used to repetitive use our uh, psych psych healthcare system. So the point is, um, how to target these dysfunctional reinforcers without blaming for intentionality. So we have to make it really clear, these this are major problems, which keep you on, uh, on PTSD, and then not to make it clear that you make this intentionally, so otherwise they say, you, you think I do this for purpose. However, if you don't treat it, you get problems with the chronicity. And what is important, we learned, um, since this, this treatment is very effective, it's a real trouble than since they have to change almost their entire life afterwards. And this is a major issue since the partners fit to PTSD. <laughs> and if PTSD get rid of this, you have most of them have really severe partner problems. So we now argue when they come in, we talk with the partners and say, listen, either you take part in the second part of the treatment or you have to be aware that this treatment could make some, change, some changes. And we have two dropouts in our, in the study I show you of, uh, of the 70 patients we treated, we have only two dropouts, and those two dropouts were their partner problems. Partners took them out since they were afraid of, this, uh, of the changes. So the whole thing is designed as a matrix structure. This is, if you are familiar with standard DBT. Standard DBT is not driven by a protocol. Standard DBT is driven by, a, by an, uh, an algorithm. This means whenever, uh, suicidality appears, you do this. Whenever treatment interfering behavior, you do this. Then you look at the, at the daily functioning and you look for behavioral analysis and the behavioral analysis give you the treatment. Here we have a clear plan. We have seven sessions on planning and motivation, then rationale and skills for, sec for four sessions, then we go for exposure for seven sessions, and then it calls regain your life for four sessions. But the whole thing is back up by the classical DBT dynamic focus hierarchy. This means whenever suicidality appears here or here or here, of course you take out the standard DBT protocol. So this is some sort of a mixture and it works quite well. Um, and the focus is everything is, is working exactly to this exposure. So the residential treatment is now, there are lots of groups. We start with psychoeducation, they get uh, skills training. We have two sorts, beginners and advanced. This is what we call mindfulness and compassionate training. Uh, and we have some sort at the beginning of the treatment cognitive interventions. This mainly is working on the fear of avoidance. <coughs> and then we have the formal exposure. And then we have some extras like body therapy, nightmare rehearsal, discrimination training and so on for those with OCD. The structure is, first we step, we start with a functional analysis of the major avoidance and escape mechanisms. We define the index, I tell you. We give them some skills, then we go for exposure, discrimination training, and the exposure works like this. All right, I go first to I tell you afterwards. Body therapy, nightmare rehearsal, and then this is regain your life. The index. One question we had to learn the hard way is, 
what would we call the index trauma? As mentioned, you have, in your patients have five, six, seven traumata, and the question is what you choose first. And since we are humans, we, we said, okay, we don't start with the worst of the worst, we start with some middle age, so that we, uh, then we said, okay, some, it's not that threatening, and we have some success, and then we can uh, work us through. The point is that this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Since the moment you are activating one of those trauma memories and you're focusing it, they simply are activating all these other trauma uh, memories. They are, they are linked. There's a neural uh, pancake stable where everything is closely linked. And this means patients always think, oh wow, I hardly can stand this trauma. The next trauma will be totally overwhelming. So they start in some, something of secondary sorts and, 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 uh, and fear and it simply didn't work. Then we changed the whole thing and said, okay, let's go for the worst of the worst first. And that works. So this means we define the index trauma as that traumatic event which is currently associated with the most distressing emotions and the most dysfunctional avoidance and escape strategies and simply this is the one you actually don't want to talk about. <laughs> so this is the indexing. And then we have the event and they write it down once and then they bring it and they read it and then we have the focus and then we go like this. This is a strong uh, imagination with a lot of tools really pushing them to get on the primary emotions and to c get them through. However, about every five, six minutes we just bring them back and give sensory uh, information index. Um, then we ask the clients to tape it uh, and they, they hear it on uh, earphones every day for an hour. And while they're doing this, they're sitting on a bicycle or on a stepper, so they do body works, just not to dissociate. And we have also developed some sort of computer program which is asking you every five or ten minutes how strong is your level of dissociation. And if it's too strong, then uh, uh, a computer program provides you add-on skills to can working and then you hear it again. The, uh, but the whole point is that you, the, the way to the, to, to the dissociative features is always the body posture. As long as you start with that and sit like this or something, then it goes on. So this means sitting on the step and hearing them works. We are monitoring the whole thing. This is some example. Every, every session and every day is monitored and you see uh, every emotion is monitored. So this is, let's say, this anxiety is this, shame is this, uh, guilt and acceptance. And you see fine, very fine, this is an example here, that these red ones are the exposure phases. Uh, this is a functioning patient for the first index. It's, the whole thing is going down. Acceptance usually is like here, it's going up. And then after a while you can say, okay, now we go for the second trauma e event. So let's say five, six sessions for the worst of the worst. Then you can add a second or a third. And this is the good thing, is, as you see here, mostly it's much easier to work after the, the next ones. The data. We have, this is now already published, so uh, it's, it's, it's old, uh, but not that old, it's published in 014. Um, so this is an RCT, of course, only against the wait list. You can say this is unfair, everything works against the wait list, but look at the data. So we have, uh, this is the treatment phase, um, then with the first assessment is, uh, uh, six weeks after discharge, then three months after discharge, six months after discharge, and we have it now one year after discharge. The wait list was treatment as usual. That means all patients had treatment. Uh, they all were, some of them were at residential inpatient treatment. We did no control for it, but of course we have the data. 70% had some sort of cognitive behavioral treatment. Um, the term why we call it wait list is since they knew that they afterwards could go in and this has an impact on the, on, on the data. So they're quite old, 35, uh, and the sexual abuse starts at about the eight of, in, in, in the average of eight, quite young. You see here, some of them report about four years or something. Like more than the half had an experience of longer than five years. The mean caps was 88. Uh, yeah, the axis one, they, are, uh, they had some sort of uh, at least three uh, additional axis one, and uh, we had. The average borderline criteria were four, so we did not require full borderline, since we actually we wanted to know the impact of borderline on treatment outcome. For that, we needed some variety. Um, so we had half of the patient had full-blown borderline, and half of the patients had less than five criteria. 
This is the cups. The green one is the wait list. And uh, you see nothing happens. This is clear. All the patients have been treated for, for 10, 12 years in, insufficiently. So nothing happens here. Uh, and the red one is, the, is our treatment group. Um, what you see that the red, the, 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 the full lines are people with more than five borderline criteria and the dotted lines are people with less than five borderline criteria. There's simply no difference. You can calculate the back and forth. There's no influence. Uh, and borderline pe people can exactly uh, do it the same way. The between group effect sizes are 1.2. Um, if you only look at the completers, it's higher. It's 1.5. But a between group effect size of 1.2 is, I think, it's sufficient and it works. The response and remission data are uh, the response rate is. And let's start with the remission rate. We have about 40% full remission, and we have about additionally about 38% partial remission. Um, this means if you start with a caps of 90 and you go down to 40, it does not mean that you're remitted, but it means you have a strong Im improvement. And this is exactly the same in borderline patients. These are the effect sizes on other features, as in the PDS, the BSL, borderline symptom list, uh, dissociation features, SCL9, the BDI. You see them, they all arranged about to 0.8 around that. Uh, the specific uh, um, instruments are more sensitive. I think that's clear. So now you, you can always show averages. The major problem where the safety issues, is it really safe? And I can guarantee the point is everybody started with exposure after four weeks. That was holy rule. Uh, why did we do this? When we first started the whole treatment, we said, okay, everybody goes to exposure. After half a year, I looked at the data and we had about 20% on exposure. Then I said, oh, friends, yeah, we cannot do this. So let's now, let's really go for exposure. And everybody said, yes, we do it. And now after half a year, we had about 32% who were on exposure. And then we turned the whole thing around and said, OK, so everybody is exactly on week four on exposure, except you as a therapist. You really have to come to the team and convince the team what is the reason not to do it. And then the whole thing turned around, and after half a year, we had 98% exposure. So we had exactly the same patients. It was a question of the therapists. They were afraid of that. And it's clear they are afraid of that, since they didn't know what, what happens. And but meanwhile, it's no problem at all. They're used to that. And it's simply, it's procedure as usual. So the safety issues, the first thing is that. Um, this is the CAPS at the beginning. The X, the Y axis is the CAPS at the end. Every dot here is a single patient in that study. This means this patient, for example, starts with a CAPS score at 60 and ends with a CAPS, CAPS score of 105. This is what you don't want. So this means that one gets got worse. This is statistic, this, there's nothing happens, and this is the group they improve. The good news is the red ones are the controls. So that means we have not one patient here who got worse. Of course, this is this study, and if you treat 600, some got worse. But anyway, it, it doesn't look as if this treatment harms. And if it comes to safety issues, we had here number of patients with self-harming behavior before treatment. We had 21 of that group. This means 60% were cutting themselves uh, at, at the start. When we took them in, 20% they, they still cut themselves. However, there's no increase. It simply kept on the way. And if we looked individually every day on cutting and so on, then you see here, this is the number of, uh, of self-harm behavior beginning. Uh, the, as, let's say they, they cut them three times a week, four times a week, nine times a week. Then they start here at, at the treatment. And this here, this week, starts exposure. And you don't see any increase, and we didn't see this. This is our, the, the daily cutters. They also come down. We don't, didn't have any increase. One minute I have. We calculated the whole thing and, and looked at the, at, the, at the sessions where we had exposure versus that session we didn't have exposure. And what you find here is that there's simply no difference between exposure uh, phased, uh, phases, where they, whether they cut themselves or not. So there's zero impact of exposure on self-harm. 
And one thing you can say now, they don't cut themselves since they're afraid of the neurosis and it's inpatient and so on. This is the urge of self for self-harm. And that is interesting. The urge still remains the same. But this is clear. This is simply conditioned brain. The brain has learned that you don't change these urges within, two, within a few weeks. So it simply remains the same. And if it comes to suicide ideation, same pattern. Still on, but no increase. So conclusions. We have evidence for the effectiveness of this treatment for patients with PTSD after CSA, with and without BBT on all primary and secondary endpoints. And the new treatment is safe. We have no adverse events. And borderline symptomatology does not attenuate the effectiveness. Currently, we brought the whole thing uh, out. This means we, uh, we manualized now this as an outpatient treatment since we knew that it's safe. And we are currently running an RCT comparing this treatment with pediatric treatment. We have uh, funded for 180. We have now recruited 120. So that means at the end of this year, we have finalized the recruitment phase and we know a little bit more. And of course, we go for process analysis, so I hope. In. And this is to thank you, not without memorizing that our fabulous, famous new journal, John Oldham would kill me if I wouldn't bring it in. We have, so please consider your research. We are, one, we are now uh, on PubMed, so it, it is worth to publish there. And this is the Vienna Congress I wanted to mention. This is oh, 2016, the European or Worldwide Borderline Congress in Vienna, where I welcome you warmly. So thank you very much. I hope you had a nice <laughs> time.